makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The former U.S. President Donald Trump sparks concern among NATO members, suggesting he could abandon them if they don't meet defense spending commitments. Israel conducts strikes on the city of Rafah in southern Gaza, where over a million people are taking shelter, as President Biden urges the Prime Minister Netanyahu to shield civilians. And traders look ahead to U.S. inflation data out tomorrow that will help shape the path ahead for the Fed. Now, also coming up in today's program, exclusive interviews with the Prime Minister of Kosovo, and Google's the MEA business and operations president. We talk, of course, AI. Now let's take a look at the European markets map. Now a lot of the focus after the week that we've had is going to be on real estate. If you look at European stocks overall, edging a little bit higher, maybe the FTSE, nothing to write home about, pretty much unchanged. Um, if you look at the optimism over eventual interest rates, cuts from the Fed, again, investors looking forward to a crucial update on U.S. inflation. So they're taking all of that into consideration. Earnings season still underway and then some of the uh, things that they're looking at is really the rate sensitive for example real estate stocks leading some of the gains in Europe oil companies laggards amid weakness for example in crude prices so we'll have a full roundup of everything that you should look out for in markets of course uh, the big story is also the rally that we saw on Wall Street on Friday. For all of this, we're joined by Ned heschler feiderb uh, Lombard Odier's Chief Investment Officer for EMEA. She's also the Head of Investment Strategy, Sustainability and Research. Danet, as always, so good to speak to you. When you look at the catalyst for a lot of these markets going forward, what do you see the, the main driver for them? And look, Francine, to start with, um, we have to simply take uh, stock of the fact that the, the likelihood of a recession in the United States is going to be um, a, a very important driver. And all the signals that we are getting at the moment is that this likelihood is receding. Um, that is very important because it sets the stage for equity markets in the current context of disinflation and when central banks are cutting rates. So these are clearly the main drivers at the moment, quite a constructive setup that is uh, shaping up for the U.S. economy, this scenario of landing, uh, and then the disinflation that is going to allow the Federal Reserve and also other central banks to cut rates, I think is going to um, absolutely give us opportunities in fixed income as well. So, and as you say, some of the main themes, of course, in equities is these falling yields and these, you know, the, the risk of a recession getting smaller and smaller. Is there a danger, though, that we're too optimistic on the path forward for following inflation? In the U.S. CPI is going to show us, um, I think, more of the same, which is that core inflation is still going to remain higher than headline inflation. So the good news are going to come through um, headline inflation still coming down, but there is this stickiness that is going to be absolutely reflected by core still exceeding headline inflation. And in that context, Francine, I think we have to uh, make way for, for the fact that the Federal Reserve will want to see a bit more of these reports um, that are gradually going to get core as well into a, an area that they feel more comfortable with, the, certainly the direction of travel that they feel more comfortable with. So we would anticipate the Federal Reserve being in a position to start cutting interest rates probably in May of this year. Um, Nanette, are, are you worried about real estate? I know we've seen it you know, be a concern in some of the smaller U.S. banks last week and the week before and starting infecting also places in Europe. I would say the following. There is always, with a business cycle, also a credit cycle. And that credit cycle absolutely has an incidence on real estate as a sector. For example, in our sector strategy, in equities, we would be underweight REITs at this moment. Um, after all, the higher yields that we have um, reached over the course of, of last year uh, is representing some headwinds for certain real estate. Uh, but um, from
from there to uh, take a view on is real estate in, in a place where it could jeopardize the soft landing scenario? We don't think so. Uh, we are still very constructive on the U.S. economic outlook and see uh, growth in the U.S. probably average around 1.2 percent, something like this in real terms this year. So when you mention actually fixed income, what part of the yield curve do you want to be exposed to? And does that also extend to European countries? This is really the, uh, an excellent question because uh, the yield curve in the United States and in other markets has been negative inverse for such a long time now. And uh, it was very deeply inverse with, for example, two-year yields exceeding 10-year yields in the U.S. by around 100 basis points back in the summer of last year. And this has now reduced to only 30 basis points. Points. In other words, uh, the yield curve is on a normalization course. It is still uh, some distance away from getting normal and positively sloped. In other words, uh, for long-term yields exceeding short-term yields, but we are on that course. And as we proceed in this normalization, there will be a case for lengthening duration. Uh, right now, as I said, two-year yield Yields have come closer to the 10-year uh, level, and uh, we will be uh, certainly monitoring uh, the duration very, very attentively as a function of the yield curve in these and these spreads with a bias to lengthen. And Nanette, I know we're only in February. There's a lot of elections coming. How does that play out into your thinking as we get into the, the extremely crucial European elections and then U.S. and others? I think 50 countries are going to vote this year. It is a dense electoral year, and by far, uh, most of the public attention will probably focus on the U.S. elections. Um, in, in the U.S., there is going to be uh, certainly a very different scenario depending on who eventually wins the presidential elections and leads the, the White House, but in collaboration, of course, always with what um, and how Congress is going to to be set up. I think um, the interesting point is, is perhaps to think about the scenario of a change in the White House. Um, and with, uh, for example, uh, Donald Trump as a lead candidate for the Republicans, if this was the scenario, then I think we ought to be thinking about what it means in terms of the foreign policy, but that very much includes tariffs. What is the stance of the United States on tariffs? That is going to be very critical for the rest of the outlook in 2025. Uh, but also, in terms of the labor market in the United States, the stance on migration, uh, whether this is going to impact, in particular, wage inflation, and therefore has to be a scenario that um, uh, needs consideration as far as the inflation outlook and central bank outlook for 2025 is concerned. And then there's simply the, the, the future course of geopolitics altogether. So I um, certainly think that geopolitics continue to play an absolutely critical role in terms of setting also the scene for financial markets and investment strategy this year and the year after. Nanette, thank you so much for joining us today. What a perfect way to get us started on a Monday morning. Nanette Heshdal, Fidel Lombardo, Jay's EMEA Chief Investment Officer. Now, coming up, Kosovo is facing heavy criticism from the U.S. and the European Union for blocking the use of a Serbian currency in the country. We discuss what it means for stability in the Balkans in our exclusive conversation with the Prime Minister of Kosovo. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Thank you.
While the worst diplomatic tensions between Kosovo and Serbia in more than two decades are under further pressure from a currency dispute. In a heated meeting at the United Nations last week, Kosovo defended its decision to enforce the euro as a country's only currency. But Serbia, the European Union and the U.S. have heavily criticized the move, saying the regulations may disrupt payments to ethnic Serbs. Now, the Prime Minister of Kosovo, Albin Kurti, says the new rules are non-negotiable and he joins me for an exclusive conversation. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Us. This certainly has made a lot of your allies very alarmed on what happens next. We've had criticism from the U.S., we've had criticism from the EU. You've refused to back down. Is that your final word? Uh, Central Bank of Kosovo made this uh, regulation, so it's an independent state agency. It's not a decision of our government. And it was not made in January this year, but in December last year. Preparations were going on and everything was going smoothly precisely out of success for preparing for uh, this uh, new regulation. Uh, Belgrade has set an alarming tone uh, with intention to uh, cause ethnic tensions. Just like we have switched from uh, car plates KM from Milosevic time to new RKS, but we're going to do Prime this Minister, as well. I mean, the, the concern is that a, a lot of people that you really rely on, right, rely on, your partners in the EU and the US have taken this at a provocation. I mean, it, it, they say you're cracking down on Serb minority in northern Kosovo. You surely could call the central bank and say, like, politically, this is not a good thing. Let's, let's reverse this. Uh, I cannot do that because we are a democratic republic and uh, independent state uh, agencies uh, are not subjugated to the government. Uh, that's why we're going to do a smooth transition. We're going to do a hotline where Serbs can call and complain for whatever is not uh, okay according to them. But we, are, we cannot reverse this decision. So they ask for more time and we're giving more time. And even our American and European partners now are saying that uh, regulation is legal because it's fighting uh, terrorist financing, uh, illicit activities. But, but Minister, uh, we should not uh, uh, be too hasty in uh, like absolute implementation. And this is what we're going, we're going to do throughout this month of February. Uh, Prime Minister, Kosovo is also preparing for municipal elections, right, in the north, which local Serbs boycotted last time, leading to the unrest that we saw in May. How will this, you know, concerns with the currency affect those elections? Uh, we have been uh, giving social benefits uh, payments to all Serbs of Kosovo, who are our citizens. I'm not only Prime Minister of Albanians, even though Albanians are 93%. We have 4% who are Serbs. And uh, thousands of uh, families and tens of thousands of uh, individuals receive uh, payments in euro. We are not uh, banning dinar, uh, we're just uh, formalizing it. We're just making things legal. Regarding these elections Prime Minister, in the they north... They can't use dinar, so if you don't ban it, no, but they, they can, can't use they it. Can, they can have dinars, and there are 10 commercial banks in Kosovo where, as means of payment, they can exchange into euro. Uh, dinars were our currency during occupation in previous century. Since liberation in 1999, we had first Deutsche Mark, yeah. German Mark, yeah. Then from 2002, so, we had euro. So, uh, Prime Minister, what is your end game with, with Serbs in the north? Well, uh, we want them to integrate in the society, and vast majority of them have done so. They have uh, Kosovar ID cards, they have Kosovar passports, they work together. The problem is not Serbs of Kosovo, the problem is autocratic regime in Belgrade, which is a Russian proxy. It's a client regime of Kremlin. And they are doing this pre-apocalyptic alarming in inciting ethnic tensions because they want to cause but, troubles in the Balkans. Prime Minister, so how do you see the integration? What does that look like? You, you talked about IDs. How do, how do you see it more concretely? Uh, almost three years ago, I won on this uh, ticket of jobs and justice. I believe that justice integrates people, fairness in the institutions, social justice, and also court justice. But on the other hand, we are also providing jobs for people despite their ethnicity. Uh, employment in Kosovo in comparison to three years ago increased by around 18 percent. And uh, that's why we want all communities to uh, benefit 
from yeah. the economic growth of Kosovo, which is over 6% of GDP uh, in average but in these last three years. Prime Minister, a, a, a number of international backers, of course, have already withheld aid because of some of your actions. Will you continue to do this despite economic repercussions? Uh, I want peace and security, but I want peace and security through democracy, through rule of law, and through constitutionality of our republic. So I'm not going to give up on one for the sake right. of the other. How will you replace missing funds? Uh, we are uh, giving uh, all our uh, like financing programs and uh, social benefits, health care grants uh, for education, for pensioners, for retirees, to all Serbs, just like we do for the Albanians. Uh, in addition, they receive from Serbia mm -hmm. some payments, mm -hmm. and they can do that because Serbia can send dinars, but in the uh, in the ATMs, they're going to receive euros. There will be this exchange from dinar to euro. We are not going to have any kind of punitive measures. We don't want to punish anyone. We want to help Serbs. I'm prime minister who wants people to have more money, not less money. And uh, I think we're going to uh, come out victorious from all this uh, uh, crisis which has been uh, caused by Belgrade, not by no. local service. But, uh, but, Prime Minister, there, there's an understanding, right, amongst international institutions that what you've done is antagonizing. And you had, when you were elected, promised a dialogue with the Serbs. So are, are you backing down on that promise? Or wh what was this, a misunderstanding? No, on the contrary, we have an agreement with Serbia. On 27th of February this year, it will be one year that in Brussels we uh, made this basic treaty. Uh, the problem is that Serbia is not signing it and is not respecting it. So uh, I think that appeasement of Serbia should stop from both Brussels and Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that they are considering Serbia as a kind of irrational actor which has to be appeased. I think we need uh, accountability, transparency, European Union and NATO for the entire Balkans, and Kosovo has no alternative to that. Uh, but Prime Minister, how important is it that you sign something sooner rather than later? We could see Donald Trump in the White House. He has been more support supportive of Serbia. Uh, I think it's important to do this as soon as possible, uh, but uh, then again, we cannot force Serbia. It is European Union and U.S. who can do that. Meanwhile, Serbia is taking... Um, uh, armament and ammunition from both uh, Russian Federation and China and uh, they want American tolerance and EU money right. in addition. But the, the way you're talking Prime Minister makes it very difficult right for the normalization to start is that how would you assess the current relationship? Uh, we have seen uh, last year Belgrade agreeing to the text of uh, agreements uh, due to pressure of EU and US so basically Pressure functions and works, but uh, it has to be done by Brussels and Washington, D.C. Uh, we are the most uh, democratic country in Western Balkans, and uh, according to Freedom House, Transparency International, World Justice Project, when it comes to anti-corruption, when it comes to uh, political rights and civil liberties, Kosovo is number one among six countries of Western Balkans which still are not part of the European Union. I understand one of the linchpins is, of course, the association of Serb municipalities in Kosovo. How's that going? Uh, that uh, is uh, now uh, turned into so-called uh, self-management of Serbian community. Is Article 7 of Basic Treaty that we have done last year. It has also an implementation annex from uh, March last year. But uh, out of 11 articles, Serbia already violated eight of them. And uh, mid-December last year, uh, Madam Prime Minister Brnabic from Serbia mm -hmm. sent a letter to EU saying that they are basically withdrawing from the agreement. Right. So for me, it's very difficult to proceed further when they don't sign the agreement, don't respect it, they do violations, and finally, they sent a letter where yeah. they say they don't obey to it anymore. Uh, Prime Minister, tensions are high. How do you see the Balkans in terms of security in, in the next 10 years? Uh, we wouldn't have these tensions if we would have de facto and de jure recognitions among all the countries. Serbia recognizes de jure, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but yeah. not de facto. On the other hand, they do recognize us de facto, but not de jure. We need all the region into EU, into NATO, yeah. but for this reason, 
Belgrade has to put sanctions to Russian Federation and adhere to Western democratic values. But, Prime Minister, do you accept that maybe the, the dinar situation that you say the central bank has put in place is not ideal timing? No, I think that uh, it was long overdue. Uh, we need uh, to legalize banking and financing. All financial institutions must have their own license from our republic, and that's what we're doing. So there will be no more sacks with cash dinar coming from Belgrade to Kosovo to destroy political pluralism and to finance terrorist organizations who killed our policemen on 24th of September yeah, last year. I mean, some institutions say that, you know, the timing is not perfect. But Prime Minister, thank you so much for, for your time, of course, for coming on Bloomberg with us. That was Albin Kurti, the Prime Minister of Kosovo. We'll have plenty more, of course, here on the markets and on the economy. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. This is the Pulse. European stocks actually edging higher after the S&P 500 on Friday, uh, close to a new record high amid optimism over eventual Fed interest rate cuts, but also investors actually looking forward to a crucial update on U.S. inflation. Uh, the inflation report tomorrow, really key, a very key event for markets as traders look on clues on what the Fed does next. Coming up, we talk geopolitics with Chatham House. This is Bloomberg. Well, former U.S. President Donald Trump sparks concern amongst NATO members, suggesting he could abandon them if they don't meet defense spending commitments. Israel conducts strikes in the city of Rafah in southern Gaza, where over a million people are taking shelter as President Biden urges Prime Minister Netanyahu to shield civilians. Plus, traders look ahead to U.S. inflation data out tomorrow that will help shape the path ahead for the Fed. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So Western leaders have criticized former U.S. President Donald Trump over his remarks on NATO over the weekend. Speaking at a campaign rally, he said he once told a European leader he'd abandon NATO members to Russian invasion if they hadn't met defense spending commitments. I said, you got to pay up. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay, you're delinquent. He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. Well, for more on this, we're joined by Bronwyn Maddox, Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House. Bronwyn, as always, thank you so much for joining us. There is a lot of uncertainty about what happens in the U.S. election, a lot of uncertainty of what it means for allies. What does this mean for a leader in Europe or elsewhere who listened to, to that rally by Donald Trump? It would have been a bit of a shocker. It really says, well, it says pretty much as clearly um, as uh, Donald Trump did, that under him, under his presidency, the U.S. Uh, not only might not come to the defense of another NATO member, as is obliged by the NATO Charter, but he would actually personally encourage uh, the Russian leader to do whatever he wanted with NATO members as a way of, uh, uh, as a punishment for them not paying into NATO. So it is, it really destroys the principle of NATO. Now, it's been a long standing, in my view, very well founded American complaint that other countries have not paid their way, were not contributed as much or built up their militaries. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that has a long history to it, it goes back um, as long as I can remember, decades, um, of, of American presidents of all stripes making this point. And they have good cause for that. But that is quite different from saying that NATO is simply a kind of commercial transaction at which the president of the U.S. is prepared to blow up uh, if one member or the other doesn't pay. And I'd be surprised if the conversation he purported to be relaying that actually happened in that way, in those words. They don't sound like the words that leader of a major country would use. 
Ron, so, so what does it mean? I know we ask a lot about whether allies can actually trump-proof their economy. I mean, is there a way that Europe and other allies are now thinking of trump-proofing their politics? And is that even possible without a strong U.S. presence? They can trump-proof their politics to some extent. And I think it's no bad thing that the U.S. gives uh, some hard thought, uh, that, that, you, that Europe gives some hard thought to how it can look after itself, not just in defence, but in, in uh, questions of, of migration, um, and how it can act as a block. And that includes countries like the UK that are very closely associated, even if not in the EU. Um, it is very hard to Trump-proof NATO because it is an alliance, and it's an alliance that does rely crucially, as it did from the beginning, on the US role. And if you take that out, and what's more, you remove the principle that if one member is attacked, the others will go to its defence. I'm not sure what you've got left in the way of an alliance. But is, is Europe, or is even NATO actually prepared for that to happen? Is there any way that in the next six to seven months, that, you know, something happens so that if, if Trump were to even, you know, get out of the NATO alliance, then the world still feels safer? The world won't then feel safer, in my view. What European countries can do and are doing is spending more on defence and, uh, and giving really very hard thought to that and how they're going to do that in the future, despite all the other pressures. And they're looking across other parts of their, their policies to see how they can uh, insulate themselves against a more isolationist US. But on this specific question of, of NATO, no, I think if he really took that view, it, it, it would destroy the alliance. Um, how much do you worry about security in general around the world? There are a number of conflicts that are very uncertain that the markets are not looking into because they probably don't know how to price it. Have, have you ever seen a year that's as dangerous as 2024 is? I haven't seen one that feels as dangerous as this in the sense of the unpredictability uh, of conflicts starting up and then not finishing. And we, we have obviously big in the headlights, uh, both Ukraine and Israel Hamas. But uh, there is also the Sudan, uh, which is is uh, really uh, roiling away in a very uh, nasty and dangerous way. Um, and it's the potential for these to spread. And then it's the potential for these to spread to terrorism because some of the technology we're seeing used like drones actually could be very easily appropriated by terrorists. So even though it feels as if we've moved from an age of talking about um, the war against terror to big states again jostling with each other, you can add terrorism into that mix as well. So I have very little comfort to add except that countries' attention is now firmly on this and on what they can do to stabilise it. Uh, Bernard, what will happen with Gaza? Can the U.S. really convince the Prime Minister of Israel to try and, you know, temper down his response to save civilians? Doesn't look like it at the moment. Um, the U.S. could try harder, though, and the U.S. always has the option of not supplying uh, arms to Israel, as it has been doing. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the President, Joe Biden's words about uh, the response being over the top um, and needing to preserve civilian life, those don't seem to have had an effect so far. And as far as we can tell from surveys of Israeli public opinion, it is still very much about getting Hamas, eradicating Hamas. So you're talking about a nation in trauma on one side, is Israel, and then the world looking at the casualties caused by Israel's response on the other. Um, I think myself, for Israel's sake, the US could try harder to make that argument and try harder to forge a way through. But at the moment, the Prime Minister of Israel um, is doing um, what his cabinet wants and what quite a lot of his own people seem to want. Yeah, why is the US not going down with a more forceful response to this? That is a really good question. I think because of the deep support for Israel, because of the respect for uh, the public opinion in Israel and the trauma that that country has suffered from the attacks of October the 7th, um, from not wanting to turn against Israel, as, as many other uh, former supporters of Israel, including um, Turkey uh, and some European countries, have done. Um, but it uh, um, is, is leaving Israel in a very difficult position. I think leaving it in the trap that Hamas created for it 
which is that Israel's actions are turning the world's opinion against it. Is, is there, I mean, we don't talk as much about Taiwan as we did two, three months ago. If, I mean, what would lead to an event where China actually thinks that it, it could um, do something significant around Taiwan without international condemnation? It will be looking most of all at the U.S. and supposing Donald Trump gets the presidency and says, look, I really don't want the United States involved in foreign conflicts, um, which he could, uh, which would be consistent with one lot of what he said, then China might take that as encouragement. If Russia were seen to win in any sense in Ukraine, China might also take that as encouragement. On the other hand, they don't quite know, as the world doesn't, what to expect of a Donald Trump presidency. He might also um, be very antagonistic towards China, and he certainly said things are consistent with that as well. So they'll be looking with, uh, with some caution. I think when, when you were asking earlier, what are, what are the reasons for optimism? Um, it is that the big powers on the whole don't want an escalation of these troubles. Uh, China, it wants Taiwan, but it doesn't want a big fight. The US, un, un, under both Biden and, and, and Trump, um, doesn't seem in the mood for engaging in foreign fights. The uh, Europeans definitely want to tamp down these things. Even Iran in the Middle East doesn't really seem to want a big fight. So you have a lot of significant countries um, not anxious to escalate things. And that's um, the best I can offer you in the way of optimism. Is there, um, I know there, there's been a lot of talk about, of course, what kind of EU leadership will look like after the European elections. Again, is this a point that we need to, you know, focus on to make sure that certainly Europe in this very uncertain world can stand on its own two feet? What we're really focusing on is the European parliamentary elections, and they're in the first week of June. And they will be a very good barometer of whether really specifically concerns about migration are running so high that it is profoundly changing the politics of many countries. And you're seeing that, whether it's in Sweden or the Netherlands or Germany and indeed Italy, that um, and it was part of uh, Brexit as well. Um, people's concerns about, about migration really leading them to either back new parties or back parties much to the right who say that they can control this. It's obviously a factor in the U.S., presidential campaign as well. Um, I think that is one one big question hanging there. Um, but the other questions are old ones of how Europe is going to answer its, its, its own questions, its economic questions about not growing fast enough um, and, and about its people's expectations of public services that their countries can't always afford. And that's an old debate. It's very much mm -hmm. the theme of the, 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 the British election coming this later this year. Um, so there's a lot to watch out for. But the common question that governments are really focused on is how to be able to say something plausible on migration. Thank you so much for joining us. Bronwyn Maddox there, Director and Chief Executive at Chatham House, looking at some of the geopolitical hotspots for 2024. Now, also, don't, make, don't miss our big interview coming up on Bloomberg TV, GOP presidential candidate Nikki Haley. She'll be live on Bloomberg Surveillance TV and radio. That's at 12.30 p.m. UK time. Coming up next in the next 30 minutes, our exclusive conversation with the German finance minister, Christian Lindner. Coming up, we'll also have an exclusive conversation with Google's president of Europe, Middle East and Africa business and operations. We'll, discussing the, we'll be discussing the opportunities for AI and the job market. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the Kansas City Chiefs became back-to-back -back champions. That's after they beat the San Francisco 49ers in only the second-ever overtime game in the tournament's history. Let's get more on the big business of the big event. <laughs> Bloomberg's Charlie Wells joins us. Now, we know who won on the field. I have a lot of questions about some of the ads, but who won on the corporate side? Oh, yeah, well, let's get to those ads. <laughs> well, look, on the corporate side, I mean, definitely the NFL, right? It's a $20 billion business in revenue annually, so that was huge. You know, Taylor Swift, she made it. She flew in from Japan. There were so many 
many questions. We were talking so about this last questions. week. <laughs> could she make it? And the couple not? of the year. Exactly. Couple of the year. They had what one columnist called a kind of rom-com ending there. But another big winner here was sports betting. And so the Supreme Court deregulated sports betting in the U.S. in 2018. And we've seen a huge explosion of growth there. And this was a hallmark moment for that industry. Now, about a quarter of Americans were expected to bet on the Super Bowl yesterday. So we'll see if that pans out. But huge moment for that industry. So is there a playbook that advertisers actually used to, you know, to get in the big bucks? Yeah, I mean, the best part of the Super Bowl, according to some people, I might be one of these people, is the ads, right? I mean, they're like huge. It's, I think, seven million dollars for 30 seconds so much production has gone into this and i would say it's interesting i mean usually at the super bowl you'll pick up on a kind of industry that's dominating the yeah. ads you look back to 2022 that was very much crypto interestingly this year there were a lot of ads for the sort of food and drink industry so we had aubrey plaza in a mountain dew ad we had an uber eats ad um, uber eats is like huge right and they had anyone i had to watch it twice well, to make sure that there was not another famous well, actor yes exactly exactly so Look, there's a statistic that shows that last year, and I'm sure that this will beat the statistic, 40% of ads had multiple celebrities in them, and that is a six-fold growth from 2010. And so, yes, you're right, lots of celebrities. Kind of hard to keep track of who's advertising what. <laughs> Um, Las Vegas, also the big winner. Huge winner. I mean, this was their first Super Bowl ever. I think they're very happy about it. They have spent so much money trying to attract big sports teams. They've got hockey, you know, uh, baseballs on the way from Oakland. I'm Californian, so this is hard. It was, you know, also hard to see the 49ers lose. Um, but they want to diversify. They get all that tourist money, and they want to boost it even more with sports. I mean, so there was so much excitement. I know there's always excitement, but also the fact that Taylor Swift were there. There were a couple of celebrity spa digs. I mean, is this really what makes it? I mean, look, it's interesting, you know, more women have been watching football lately. You know, about half of viewers in the last Super Bowl were women. I think I'm not a woman, but I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan, so this is really exciting. She, she, she I mean, she brings inflation to she places. Br she's she like she's an economic phenomenon. Well, you want to talk about inflation? The tickets for this Super Bowl were, nine, on average, $9,815. It's so expensive. Um, but a lot of excitement um, and a lot of money spent. There you go. If I had to write one book on economics, it'd be a Taylor Swift economics book. Maybe I'd co-write it with Charlie Wells. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll have plenty more shortly. This is Bloomberg. Now, experts struggle to get an accurate picture of just how many jobs will be eliminated as artificial intelligence advances. One tracker has actually reported U.S. firms have announced 4,600 job cuts since May related to artificial intelligence, but there are fears that this could be a vast underestimate. Now, of course, one of the companies at the forefront, very forefront of AI development at Google, and the firm just announced 25 million euros of funding to support AI training and skills for people across Europe. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined for an exclusive conversation by Google's president of business and operations in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, Matt Britton. Matt, as always, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at some of the changes in AI and what that means for job losses, like, can you quantify it and what does retraining actually look like? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, there's an array of analysis out there, isn't there? But the most important thing is that we make sure that nobody's left behind, behind by AI. Actually, uh, estimate of 1.2 trillion euros, 1.2 trillion euros of economic growth in Europe if we land it well. Definitely the case that the work we do will change. For most people, what they do within their jobs is likely to shift. For some people, maybe the work will go away, and those are the ones we really need to make sure we retrain, but then there will be whole new industries. You know, when I left university, the web hadn't been invented, and for the last 20 years I've worked in the job that depended on it. We didn't have web de designers and data analysts and so on then. So I think there's an overall huge opportunity. And the reason we're launching this um, opportunity initiative for Europe with 25 million euros is to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. Yeah, but Matt, I guess the difficulty is that you don't really know where we'll end up. So we don't really know the skills needed for tomorrow. Do you do this with governments? How do you see, if I tell you, look, Matt Britton, what, what does the workforce look like in five and then 10 years? What, how do you answer that? Yeah. Well, the good news is we've had some experience here. So when I took this role eight years ago, there was a digital skills gap in Europe. And we set out to try and train a million Europeans in digital skills. 
Now, eight years later, we've trained 12 million, and we've worked with governments, ministries of labor, small business associations, trade unions, and others to bring digital skills to everyone. And that's why we're confident in this 25 million euro opportunity initiative that we're going to try to reach out to those people who are perhaps most vulnerable or in underserved communities. 10 million euros straight away is going towards reaching workers who are likely to be most vulnerable. We're also um, boosting our growth academy for startups, which is most people affected by AI will be in AI using economy. Startups are likely to be the AI building economy. So we're launching an effort with health to begin with there. And then um, building on our digital skills stuff, we've got AI fundamentals for everyone. And we're making that available in 18 more languages today. So I think the right thing to do here is say that AI has huge opportunity to help all of us in science, health, work, education, and life. But there's a risk that some are left behind. And that's why we need to lean right. in together uh, with governments and others to make sure that we're equipped for the future. You're right, we don't know exactly what those jobs are, but we do know people will be, and need to be able to but be confident try. in using yeah. the tools. And Matt, how does AI regulation in Europe actually affect, I guess, your development and rollout of AI products versus the rest of the world? Yeah, um, I think what we see in Europe is incredible skills and desire for AI. When you survey people, um, the vast majority of Europeans um, believe that AI can have a uh, benefit uh, to them and to society. So there's a desire to see it landed. But what the surveys tell us across 17,000 Europeans and others is that they want governments and technology companies to work together to make the technology safe and accessible to everyone. Now, today's initiative is making sure that it's accessible to everyone, making sure it's safe. That's for the uh, regulators to set out the guardrails and the AI Act in Europe the ink is just drying on that, and that has been a two or three year engagement with companies like ours and communities to try to come up with good rules of the road. And now the devil's in the detail of how we apply that. But we think it's such an important technology, it needs to be regulated so that we can harness it for good for everyone. And is it really, if you look at, for example, your cloud business, is it all about AI that's driving demand or is it a little bit more balanced? Yeah, there's an array of things, but I think a couple of things I'd say that, you know, it's easy for people to think that AI and chatbots are the same thing. Actually, AI has been around for much longer, uh, and it's much more than, than chatbots. So, you know, seven or eight years ago at Google, we, we tried to pivot to be an AI-first company. And Google Translate is perhaps where it was born. You know, the connection of languages and understanding languages led to technical breakthroughs mm -hmm. and these things called large language models, which are now powering lots of the generative AI you see. But AI is useful for so much. And the most exciting areas, I think, for society are scientific and health breakthroughs. So if I take you know, researches into vaccines that's been top of mind for some time or drugs or crop resilience, that depends on understanding proteins. And a few years ago, there were about 175,000 proteins that had been painstakingly identified in 3D structure by PhD students. It would take five years for one PhD student to find one 3D structure of a protein. Now, AlphaFold, built by my colleagues at Google DeepMind, changed all that. And in a matter yeah. of months, they catalogued 200 million proteins. They're available for free to every expert working uh, in this area. And now 1.7 million experts are using AlphaFold and that database of proteins yeah. to advance drug discovery, disease research, crop resilience research. So I think things like that, which maybe people don't see when they see the headlines about AI, that are changing um, what's <laughs> oh. going to be possible. They, they see it on Bloomberg. Matt, if, if you were to go back to university now, given what we know about where AI takes us, what would you study? What do you tell young people to study? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I, I graduated. I'm quite old, Francine, so I graduated in 1989. You're not. That was the year that Tim Berners-Lee <laughs> came up with the idea of the web. And like for the last 20 years, my, my professional life has depended on that invention. So I think it's impossible for us to predict, you know, technically what we will need, but we will need um, skills, yeah. critical thinking, creativity, Matt, collaboration. Thank you. Matt Britton, thank you so much.